Part 7 starts with Lieutenant Tharl showing up for the night shift in his workout sweats. Kelly asks him to change into his uniform, but Mercer allows him to stay in his clothes. Hearing this, Kelly is surprised and tells Mercer that he has been in a more relaxed mood lately. Meanwhile, Tyler reports to the captain that she has finished the dark matter survey he requested. Mercer then leaves his shift early to watch a movie with Tyler, the girl he has started dating. After watching the movie, the two agree to reveal their relationship to the rest of the ship. Tyler then asks Mercer to visit an exotic planet on a holiday date, and the latter excitedly agrees. In the following scene, Mercer confides in Malloy about his relationship with Tyler. Although he is in love with Tyler, Malloy says he supports any relationship that makes his best friend happy, and advises him to tell Kelly. Later, Mercer visits Kelly's quarters and tells her that he is dating Tyler. He also says that he and Tyler will take a holiday trip to a planet called Sensoria II while the Orville will be under Kelly's watch. Surprisingly, Kelly understands the assignment and reveals that she is actually happy for him to have finally found someone. The following morning, Mercer and Tyler depart via a shuttle to Sensoria, but their holiday is interrupted by the arrival of three Krill ships. Mercer immediately advises Tyler to cloak the shuttle, but Krill soldiers vent drive the plasma that exposes their position. Following this, the Krill soldiers seize the shuttle by a tractor beam to their ship and hold the pair hostage. In the Orville, Kelly tells Bordas that the crew will be joined by their new permanent chief of security the following week. Meanwhile, Mercer and Tyler are trapped in separate prisons. A Krill prison guard threatens to torture Tyler until Mercer gives the guards his planetary union command codes. Back on the Krill ship, the school teacher, Telia enters Mercer's chamber and reveals that she was actually Janel Tyler working undercover. She explains that she escaped the planetary union and enlisted as an operative to lure Mercer, seeking revenge for the murder of her crew. Mercer asks how she managed to stay undercover, to which Telia explains that she used transcellular micro-grafting to disguise herself as a human. Suddenly, the ship is attacked by the Chactal, an alien species bordering Krill space. Chactals get into the ship and start to kill the Krill soldiers. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Mercer manages to knock down the guard and escapes. Left with no other choice, Telia also follows him in an escape pod before Chactals can catch them. The two then fly to the surface of a nearby terrestrial world before crashing into a lake. After a while, Mercer awakens to find himself unconscious under a tree, while Telia points a rifle at him. She orders him to carry their pod's distress beacon to the mountain so that they can transmit a signal. When Mercer asks who attacked them, Telia explains the Chactal are waging a war upon the Krill for destroying one of their colonies. Later, as the two are hiking through the forest, Telia admits she hated watching films with Mercer when she disguised herself as Tyler. She then threatens to kill him once they reach the mountain peak. Mercer asks if her romantic feelings for him were authentic, and Telia responds that it was all part of her act. Just then, some Chactal soldiers arrive at the scene but the two manage to hide under the trees. Mercer realizes they cannot climb up the mountain before dawn, so they must shelter in a cave at the base of the mountain until nightfall. In the cave, Mercer tries to reason with Telia that the planetary union and the Krill will need to work together. However, Telia instead mocks him for falling in love with a fake Janel Tyler. The next morning, Mercer wakes up early and discovers that a day on the current planet is equivalent to 23 days on Earth. If they are to survive, Telia must allow Mercer to climb the mountain alone since she cannot go outside during the day, as Krills get burned under sunlight. Distressed, Telia agrees after Mercer promises to return for her. The latter then climbs to the mountaintop and sends a message to the Orville. Fortunately, Kelly and the others get the signal, and they immediately set course to the planet. After his call, Mercer returns to the cave but sees four Chactal soldiers following him. He rescues Telia to the mountain peak, hiding her from the sunlight with his jacket. Thankfully, the Orville arrives at the right time to pick up Mercer and Telia but the Chactal opens fire from below. Mercer returns fire with Telia's gun until they board the ship and escape. Back on the Orville, Mercer releases Telia back to the Krill while ignoring Kelly's strong objections. Later, the crew hands Telia over to her people in the shuttle bay. In the next scene, the first prefect, the governmental head of Planet Rigor 2, gathers his advisors and directs them to use a large satellite to send a message, is anyone out there, into space. In the Orville, Mercer and Kelly meet their new permanent chief of security, Lieutenant Tala Kiali, as Zelayan. She promises to fulfill her responsibilities and protect the crew. Later in the control room, Kelly asks Bordas to have a joint birthday party, but the latter firmly declines. Suddenly, the crew receives the message from Rigor 2 and become excited. Mercer, Kelly, Bordas, Kiali, and Dr. Claire take a shuttle to the planet. In the capital, the first prefect warmly greets the Orville crew. 
He and his advisors then show the crew their satellite array. Meanwhile, Rigorian doctors show Dr. Claire and Kiali their obstetrics ward. They are interrupted by an emergency room for cesarean section. But Dr. Claire notices the baby had no detected medical issue to be born prematurely. Meanwhile, a doctor explains that the C-section was to prevent the baby being born Jiliac. In the next scene, the Orville's crew and the Rigorians celebrate their first contact and share a meal together. Kelly shares that next week will be her and Bordas birthday. Strangely, this outrages the Rigorians and the first prefect orders his crew to arrest the Orville members. Later, a dentist extracts dental cores from Mercer, Kiali, and Dr. Claire, which verifies that none of them are Jiliacs. The crew is informed that being Jiliac means being born under the astrological sign of Jiliac. People born Jiliacs are dangerous, and they show violent tendencies so they must be kept in a small prison camp. While Mercer and the rest are forced to leave the planet, Kelly and Bordas are taken to the camp. Once in the camp, the warden tells Kelly and Bordas that prison is now their new home. Back in the Orville, Mercer pleads with Admiral Perry to retrieve the officers by force. But the Admiral doesn't think using force is the right way, so diplomacy will be their only recourse. In the prison, Kelly and Bordas piece together that their only crime was being born under the wrong astrological sign. Meanwhile, Mercer and Kiali arrive at the first prefect's office and attempt a peaceful agreement for the return of his officers. However, the first prefect refuses and tells them to never come back to the planet once again. A month has passed but the Orville's crew cannot get Kelly and Bordas back. In the meeting room, Mercer directs the senior officers to find a solution as soon as possible as time is running out for them. In the prison, Kelly and Bordas notice that a pregnant woman named Eukania is in labor. Without thinking twice, Kelly assists the woman in delivering a daughter. Back in the Orville, Kiali studies Rigor two seconds history and finds that a star under Jiliac constellation vanished 3,122 years ago which led to the Rigorian myth that Jiliacs are a bad omen and upright murderous. In the camp, Kelly and Bordas get sick of the torture so they plot their escape. Meanwhile, Lamar and Malloy explain to the senior officers that if they attach solar sails to a shuttle, it would reflect starlight that would appear in the Rigorian night sky as the lost star under the Jiliac constellation. And once the Rigorians know that their lost star is back, they would treat Jiliacs as equals to other signs. Elsewhere, Kelly and Bordas knock out two of the prison guards and steal their guns. After killing several guards along the way, they blast open the prison doors, but are immediately surrounded by the warden and his soldiers. The warden then initiates a public execution of Kelly and Bordas. In the meantime, Lamar and Malloy deploy the solar sails and the lost star appears in the night. Just as the guards are about to kill Bordas and Kelly, they spot the star in the Jiliac constellation. As a result, the first prefect realizes that they now need a change in their system. Now back on the Orville, Kelly and Bordas finally celebrate with a joint birthday party. Mercer tells Kelly that all the prisoners of the camp were released, but Kiali is concerned about whether deceiving the Rigorians about the star was moral. One day, Dr. Claire requests Isaac to review her draft paper on nanosynthesis and Zellian tissue regeneration. Isaac scans the paper and corrects some technical errors. Before he leaves Dr. Claire's office, he notices Claire has styled her hair differently and compliments it. Meanwhile, the Orville is en route to hear the Planetary Union Symphony perform. Dr. Claire enters the control room and invites everyone to attend her son Ty's piano recital that evening. During the recitals, Ty performs wonderfully. After the session, Dr. Claire chats with Isaac, who is also Ty's piano instructor. Isaac tells her that she should be proud of Ty. Later, Dr. Claire visits Kelly for romance advice. She admits she has developed feelings for Isaac, and Kelly tells her to pursue him but warns her to not get hurt since he is an artificial being with no emotions. In the next scene, Dr. Claire finds Isaac working in the science lab and asks him out to the symphony on Friday. He gladly accepts as it is the right opportunity for him to study biological life forms in a new way. Later, Isaac asks Malloy and Lamar for dating advice, and they recommend dressing up cool on the first date. As soon as Isaac leaves, the pair rush to tell Mercer and the senior crew. They speculate whether a romance will be possible between a human and an artificial being. On Friday evening, Isaac rings Dr. Claire's quarters, and the doctor is surprised to see Isaac dressed up so well. They then leave for the symphony night. After the symphony, Dr. Claire and Isaac share a meal in the simulator. Isaac programmed the simulation to mirror Claire's favorite restaurant in Baltimore, Maryland, where she grew up. He reveals that he studied every file about Dr. Claire before their date. However, she still finds him lacking spontaneity as he knows everything about her. Before retiring for the night, Dr. Claire gives a goodnight kiss to Isaac. The next day, the senior crew asks Isaac for details about his date. He shares that Dr. Claire found him not spontaneous enough 
and they suggest doing something considerate yet surprising for her. Meanwhile, Kelly asks Dr. Claire about the night before and the doctor confesses that they did not connect emotionally. In the following scene, Isaac brings a chocolate cake to Claire in her quarters at 3 a.m. in hopes of being spontaneous. Unfortunately, the plan does not work and instead, a shocked Claire breaks up with him, explaining that they could never work out. The next day, Isaac approaches Malloy and Lamar for help and the latter suggests an idea. Elsewhere, in her office, Dr. Claire receives an anonymous message directing her to the simulator. When she arrives, it is the simulation of her favorite restaurant. Only this time Isaac has programmed himself to look and feel like a human. Dr. Claire is stunned to see Isaac in a human form and quickly falls for the idea. Isaac then tells Claire that Lamar suggested he create such a simulation. She is charmed and the two quickly bond over dinner. They kiss for a while and the doctor runs a program of her own quarters. As a result, the two finally make love. The following morning, Dr. Claire meets with Kelly and Kiali and beams about the other night she spent with Isaac. However, Isaac wants to end the relationship because he collected enough data for his analysis. Namar suggests that Isaac make himself unpleasant so that Dr. Claire will be the one to end things. Later that evening, Isaac speaks misogynistically to Dr. Claire to irritate her. Realizing that he wants to end the relationship, a heartbroken and furious Claire does it herself. Following the breakup, Dr. Claire finds recourse in a drink at a simulated bar. Meanwhile, in the control room, Isaac makes a calculation error while analyzing the orbital velocity of a star system. Malloy notes that he had never seen Isaac make such a mistake before. Isaac then goes to scan himself using the ship's computer and learns that his algorithms have adjusted to Dr. Claire's presence, which now interferes with his programming when she is gone. Just then, Mercer arrives at the scene and learns about Isaac's condition. He chuckles, realizing the artificial life form has fallen in love. Isaac wants to repair his relationship, and Mercer recommends he apologize creatively before exiting the room. In the next scene, Dr. Claire arrives in the control room thanks to another anonymous message summoning her. Isaac then announces he sent the message, and starts playing an original recording of Singing in the Rain. Realizing that Dr. Claire loves the rain, he initiates a simulation program to make it rain in the room. He then asks the doctor to try a relationship with him once again. He explains that his internal programs will function more efficiently when he is with her. Hearing this, Dr. Claire runs to his arms and kisses him. The pair then exit the control room for the simulator, and Isaac transforms into a human along the way. Subscribe to see more videos like this, turn on the notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Don't forget to watch part 8 on series recap too. Thanks for watching.